the following presentation was recorded at the 2014 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond sponsors in 2014 for helping make these videos possible. Okay. My name is David Cantrell, and if you're here about Slackware, then you're in the right place. This is Old Timer Slackware Rag Chew. I didn't actually come up with the title. I don't know who did, but I'm just going to run with it. Uh, for those who don't know me, uh, I used to be part of the Slackware Linux core team a long time ago. And people will occasionally ask me about what I did with Slackware and uh, uh, you know, do, do I do anything with it anymore? So I, I don't know, I thought this would be an interesting opportunity to kind of walk through the past and what I dealt with at Slackware and kind of some of the old problems and, and how stuff was terrible back then um, and how stuff is terrible today, but in a different way. Um, I also am not going to go all the way back to the beginning. We're not going to talk about how we installed using 65 floppy disks, which is the most common comment I see from people online when the topic of Slackware comes up. Uh, those people are all lying. None of them ever installed Slackware from floppy disks, especially if they graduated in 2005. Um, so <laughs> we're going to talk about the more recent Slackware history, the mid-90s and I guess early 2000s. This is the part that everyone skips over, and it's when Linux was really big and booming. This is the time period when Red Hat, my current employer, IPO'd. This was when tons of money was coming at Linux. Everyone wanted a piece of it, and everyone did everything they could to be in that game. It was very interesting to be part of that time period. Um, I have some photos in here, and you'll get to see, you'll get to see the Slackware corporate jet. Um, yes, we did actually have a corporate jet, uh, and it was really kind of interesting. So. All right, what? As I explained, let's talk about the bad old days. Old tech was difficult and annoying. New tech is differently annoying. And I like to talk about old stories. Why? And it, it's primarily, be, primarily because I want people to understand what we went through so we don't recreate the same problem. I see that happen a lot today, where people new to Linux, which is great, we want new people, they will be approaching a problem and they won't understand what went on even like two or three years ago and it's the exact same thing. So I find that you know telling these stories it's fun and you get to remember hey we did something like that you know a while ago let's go and look at how it worked or didn't work. Like I said I rarely get to talk about this I do a lot of presentations at Red Hat conventions and conferences and things like that um, but despite having worked at Red Hat now for almost nine years and Having been out of Slackware for so long, it is still the most common thing I get recognized for and asked about. Um, so here we go. This is lifted from my presentation last year. I'm David Cantrell. I manage the installer team at Red Hat. I went to Georgia Tech, studied computer science. This is a short list of projects I've worked on, starting with Slackware, Afterstep, the window manager, Python, Fedora, Red Hat Enterprise Linux, Anaconda, the installer, Proc PS, GNU Parted, Pi Parted, ISC, DHCP, Network Manager, and the list goes on. I've had my hands in a lot of things, which means that my code is on a lot of devices that I pay a lot of money for. Um, I learned that Proc PS and Parted are part of the Nest thermostat, and I just spent $500 on those, and I was like, you know what? I wrote some of that code. They should give me one of those, but no. Oh, yeah, and the common desktop environment. Okay, Slackware releases with me around. How many people have seen the unofficial Slackware release history? It's on like slackware.org.uk or something. Yep, okay. Uh, so that's actually a really good detailed history. There is a short time period in there, like I was describing the mid-90s to 2000, uh, where I was heavily involved. Um, <laughs> I put 3.4, but I think it was 3.3. 3.4, 3.5, 3.6, 3.9, 4.0, 7.0. 7.1. I was gone after 7.1 because I stopped receiving a paycheck. Um, does anyone remember Slackware 3.9? Okay. Do you remember the difference between it and 4.0? There we go. Yeah, 2.0 kernel. Yeah, a lot of people still wanted to stick with the 2.0 kernel, and we had moved to 2.2 with Slackware 4.0. So that was the only thing that was different, and uh, I, you know, kept a lot of the users happy. 
trade shows. I spent a large part of my time going to trade shows. Starting with the very first Linux World Conference and Expo in 1998 in San Jose, California. Then IDG started doing at least two of those a year and I kept going to every single one. Uh, we also did NetWorld. I have no idea where it was or when it was. I just remember, remember being there. Comdex, when that was like a thing. Is it still a show? I don't even know if it is. Um, and because I'm from Atlanta, I made sure we went to the Atlanta Linux Showcase when that was a show. Show locations, San Jose, San Francisco, New York, Las Vegas. Linux was really big at this time. There was a lot of money to spend, so we went to really good venues. Uh, the Javits Center in New York, uh, the Convention Center in Vegas we used is no longer standing. Uh, Atlanta, one of them used the World Congress Center there, the other one used the Cobb Galleria Center. We used the Moscone in San Francisco, San Jose Convention Center um, was comparable size that we used there. Who wants to see pictures? All right. So here's the very first Linux World. Uh, this was 1998. That's me standing up, sort of facing the camera. Uh, the guy to the left, that's Logan Johnson. And the guy behind him is Brett Person eating nachos. Um, our primary uh, goal at this show was to sell t-shirts. Um, and we sold a lot of t-shirts because everyone wanted a t-shirt. Uh, my, we, we used this booth for a long time. This was 10 feet by 10 feet. And that's just a carpeted background. And I hated that sign because it said Linux Slackware. It's like, why can't we reprint this damn thing to say Slackware Linux? No one calls it Linux Slackware. But they never did because that cost too much money, apparently. Uh, we were instead paying for union guys to plug in our uh, computers and set up our chairs, which if you did that on your own, you got fined. Uh, here's me in the corporate jet. Um, can't really see it on the screen very well, but these will be posted online. Our corporate jet was a 1993 Buick Regal. Um, <laughs> got a little under 20 miles to the gallon. Um, it was quite comfortable on the inside, had working air conditioning, um, and uh, very, very uh, uh, ample luggage space. Um, occasionally, I was the pilot in command, but on this trip, I was uh, enjoying being a passenger. Uh, this is the Atlanta Linux Showcase. Um, Again, this was, uh, I don't even know where it was. A lot of, so these pictures all came to me from people who took them and then emailed them to us. They were taken with real film cameras and then scanned, which is why the quality is total crap. Um, but that's what we had back then. Um, so th these are just, they were as interesting to me when they showed up and I've just kind of filed them away forever. This is in uh, Las Vegas. Um, that's all of us. Uh, well, we're almost all looking at the camera. Uh, Pat Volkerding, me, uh, Chris Lumens, and the back of Logan's head. Uh, this was inside the 50 foot by 50 foot BSDI booth, which we were anchored to BSDI for a while. Emphasis on anchor, I went down with the ship. Uh, that was pretty fun. Um, this is us in New York trying to get Slackware working on a Sony VAIO laptop. Um, so old stuff sucked a lot, including laptops. Uh, none of the hardware worked out of the box. Uh, that was a kernel developer who was trying to help us out. Um, we only ever got you know, two or three devices working and then gave up. Uh, it was frustrating back then. And this is Walnut Creek CD-ROM in uh, Times Square. Not a great picture, but uh, a lot of these guys have moved on to Apple. Uh, the FreeBSD guys, and uh, well, obviously I'm at Red Hat. This was the famous BSD booth and the Slackware booth, uh, which was the former FreeBSD booth, which we repurposed uh, with the big S dot on it. Um, that was a rotating sign that we had that lit up in the middle. Uh, again, lots of money. I mean, it just it was crazy that we had cranes to set all this stuff up, and uh, we had a we had two. 18 wheelers uh, to bring our stuff to each trade show. Um, and then we and then everyone flew on different flights because you don't want to fly everyone on the same flight for fear of crashing and killing the entire development team. Um, <laughs> exactly, yeah. Um, so like I was saying, these uh, photos were sent to us by random people. We oftentimes got people who would come up and say, hey, oh, you're, you're David uh, on the Slack team. Can I get a picture with you? Sure, I have no idea who you are. And well, these pictures would show up in our inbox. This is Chris Lumens with 
someone. Uh, you can see the, the back of uh, the badge uh, had BSDI. We, we always paid uh, to sponsor those badges. That was another one of those things. We just had money to burn. Um, this is in New York. I was, uh, this was the only show where we demoed Slackware Linux on Spark. Um, and that's uh, Sun Ultra 10 there. And that is a, um, a BSD kernel developer who was disappointed that uh, I was not showing FreeBSD running on Spark. And then I told him, but you guys don't support Spark. So also it's BSD and I don't really care. Um, it's that same guy again. I don't know. He sent us, sent us a bunch of pictures. This was in New York as well. And you can see some of the companies in the background. I don't know if anybody's been paying attention to that. There's VA Linux. I don't know if anyone remembers that company. Uh, here's that Ultra 10 again. Uh, Sun was very uh, supportive of Slackware uh, being ported to Spark. They gave us a lot of loaner hardware. Uh, they put us on sun.com, uh, the website. They gave us lots of resources. It was really cool. Of course, when the company went under, um, they sent me a bill for all the hardware. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, that's not going to work. Uh, so Chris and I rented a U-Haul, loaded everything up, and drove it back to Santa Clara. Um, so we only had to pay 99 bucks for a U-Haul uh, to return it all. Uh, had to take it back to Building 27. The big giant sign hanging from the ceiling was, uh, I pushed for that uh, a lot. We had the art department put that together, and then it was uh, a frame. We had used it for FreeBSD, and they stopped using it once they got the big 50 by 50 booth. So we uh, wrapped it with a Slackware banner, and you had to pay you had to pay the convention center to bring in a crane to hang it. Um, but that, that was really popular at the time. You know, every company had something hanging from the ceiling if they wanted to be seen. Um, I don't know what happened to any of this stuff. I don't know where any of the booth equipment ended up. I assume it's either in garages and basements or it just got left in buildings and trucks. Uh, but that stuff was very expensive to come by. Here's the whole team in San Jose. Uh, and we're all facing the camera, which is really cool. So left to right, we have Pat, uh, me, Logan Johnson, Chris Lumens, and Kate Ornberg, who did artwork for us for a while. Uh, my favorite thing in this picture is in the background, we see Helix Code, the GNOME company. You remember them before they changed their name to Zemian. Um, we have Sun Microsystems hanging from the ceiling there. Um, and eGrail, which I can't remember what they did, but I remember their booth. They had, they, they paid for a guy to stand in the corner with a headset mic and just kind of draw people in. And we heard this five minute demo just repeat for three days. Uh, it was really annoying. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I don't know what happened to them. Uh, and we also, uh, this was in New York again, we had Slackware Linux ported to Alpha, which we demoed. That was a uh, loaner system, I think from Digital or Alpha Processor Incorporated. Um, the Alpha was fun at the time. It was the fastest system that we had to work with, and Compact provided us with a C compiler. So companies in the background that I was pointing out, Stormix Technologies, who remembers them? Vancouver, British Columbia, they made Storm Linux, which was one of many failed commercial attempts at Debian. Um, our current failed attempt is Ubuntu. Um, we also... <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, uh, let's see, there was Storm Linux. Uh, Ian Murdoch also founded Prod uh, Progeny, um, which went for a couple of years and that folded. Um, Corel, uh, also in Canada, they made Corel Linux around this time. Uh, Corel put a lot of engineering effort behind Linux in general, specifically Wine and KDE. Corel is the reason we got um, Windows Network Neighborhood Browsing and KDE. They did all that work. And they're the reason Wine uh, was really brought up to speed and can run a lot of useful applications if you need that. Um, but they couldn't really make, uh, make any headway with Corel Linux because that name associated with Linux just didn't work. Storm was, uh, Storm was an interesting company. I got to meet the founder. He was a really cool guy. And uh, they came up with some interesting technologies that uh, still live on in Debian today. Uh, Linio was in the background. I, I, can't remember what they did. Turbo Linux, anyone remember them? <laughs> yeah, Turbo Linux, you know what happened to them? No, oh, okay, they, they merged, before completely going under, they merged with a company called Linux Care, 
Does anyone remember Linux Care? Yeah, the general support company. You could just call them up and say, I'm running Slackware, I want to buy a support contract. And they would, they would certainly sell you a support contract. Uh, I question what kind of support you got from them, but it worked for a few years. Uh, Turbo Linux was really big in Japan, couldn't really make headway in the US. Um, it was originally a, a Japanese translation of Slackware, um, but then sort of underwent a lot of changes. Uh, and they decided to prop each other up on their way to failure. Um, but they, uh, they, were, uh, they had interesting booths as well. They, they, had, um, they hired a guy, I don't know if his site is still up, but he went by the name the Infotainer. Um, and this guy, uh, he, was, he was like a used car salesman and he was just really big into the, I'm standing on a trade show and hey, hey you, have you heard about Turbo Linux? And you know, just kind of the, the corner salesman. And it would, it would be, bring people into the booth. And what was irritating is that we were, for whatever reason, always positioned next to them and they would use the aisle and he would stand on the corner and he's like, oh, well, you know, they're overflowing, but we're not breaking any rules. Um, I have a, a video of our uh, retaliation uh, that we did in Las Vegas. Uh, it involved a lot of Nerf weapons and public humiliation, and it was kind of fun. Um, <laughs> he, he got really embarrassed, but, you know, in the end, he realized it didn't matter. Um, Red Hat uh, in the background and still around, uh, so that's good. VA Linux, which this was after they had changed their name from VA Research. I don't know if you remember when they were called that. And then after VA Linux, they went through what, like 5,000 name changes, and I don't know what happened to them. Uh, I tried to figure that out yesterday. O'Reilly, still alive and going somehow uh, with books. Helix Code, which is my, my favorite, because uh, we, we got them in there with, uh, before they were Zimian. Well, uh, VA Linux started SourceForge. Um, they, they started that and uh, then ended their hardware business and focused primarily on software. And for a long time, they were providing um, mirrors for all the distributions. And uh, it was cool. I had an SSH account into their FTP server for a while. Um, and it was, they, they had lots of bandwidth and SourceForge was, it was early in that whole sort of integrated, um, you know, we're going to host your project, provide bug tracking and stuff. But now it's, you know, it's, if it hasn't completely lost ground, it's certainly losing ground to more modern things like GitHub and things like that. eGrail, don't know them. Uh, Sun Microsystems. All right, the book. A lot of people ask me about the Slackware Linux Essentials book. Yes, we wrote a book to replace the rusty gear book that had been shipping with Slackware ever since Walnut Creek CD-ROM had been publishing them. Um, we called it Slackware Linux Essentials. Um, at some point in time, I don't know if it's still up there, but Amazon has me listed as an author, um, which I think is kind of weird. Uh, we had to write software to, uh, to help SGML tools along. We were required to write the, uh, the book in SGML because that was the, the hot thing of the time. Um, it, it was a lot of late nights trying to get it to generate an index. It was really very annoying. Uh, we converted it to LaTeX. Actually, Chris did the conversion to LaTeX, um, but that was after the company went under and we never published it again. Uh, still have all the sources. Uh, the website, www.slackware.com, that's me and Logan who primarily did that. Um, you're welcome. Uh, Slackware, for the longest time, never had a website. Um, we, uh, we didn't really have a plan. We just wanted to get something up and running and then it sort of stuck. Uh, we, put, we had web discussion forums on there. We used the forum software written in PHP. Um, and this is actually wrong. We used uh, PHP 2 at the time. Again, it was at that point in time, it was static uh, HTML, PHP, or Perl and I don't know why we went with PHP, honestly. The logo. So I still see the logo around to this day. There's a shirt, Slackware Linux shirt. You have one on. And it's amazing to me. This was done in a Georgia Tech dorm room using GIMP on whatever version of Slackware we had. Um, Logan came up with it using the Courier font and just tossed two lines in there. And we're like, yeah, it looks good. And we put it on the site. And I am shocked that it's still kind of the logo. Like, it, it's everywhere. I just, I don't know, it's kind of weird to me. Um, 
Does anyone remember 4.0 to 7.0? Okay, yeah, yeah. Does anyone remember like why we did that? Yeah. Well. Um, yeah. Well, that was that was part of the justification. So we were moving from libc5 to glibc. But we uh, skipped all the version numbers because at those trade shows, people would come up to us and like the current version of Red Hat at the time was six dot something or whatever, and they would come up to us and say, "When are you going to upgrade to Linux six dot two? And you know, this was this would be just IT people. This would be press. This would be analysts. And we're like, you know what? This is, you know, forget all this. Let's just jump the version number. So uh, we did, and uh, yeah, it just kind of ran from there. Um, and I think after that, Patrick, uh, he was just doing dot zeros and dot ones for, for a while, um, which, you know, that's, that works. Um, yeah, there were, there were a lot of long uh, discussions and a lot of back and forth as to whether or not we should do it. And uh, I forget the exact circumstances or quantity of alcohol consumed before we decided to do that. Um, but it was in San Jose when we made the decision. Where did we get our paychecks? Subscriptions. So anyone that subscribes to Slackware, thank you. That paid me for a while. Um, anytime we made a release, we would do a run, and then you could bill all of the subscription credit cards immediately, which was very useful. Um, OpenBSD kind of survives on that model, doing two scheduled releases a year at $50 Canadian a piece, and that guarantees them a certain amount of income per year, which is useful for the project. We had a similar model. Um, Walnut Creek CD-ROM was my first employer. They were the publisher. Uh, they were then, we were acquired by BSDI. Um, and then, I don't have it on here, but we were, we merged with Telenet Systems in San Jose. So we really had no idea what we were doing at that point. Um, when BSDI acquired us, they were so desperate to push FreeBSD that we started being pushed to the side and, um, you know, e even at the Linux shows, it's like, this is called Linux World, and you're giving us a 10 by 10 booth, and you're giving FreeBSD a 50 by 50 booth. That doesn't make sense. Uh, so a lot of people were confused about, you know, how are these positioned? Do they compete with each other? Are they complementary? Is one based on the other? Uh, so they kind of they kind of screwed up on that a lot, in my opinion. Uh, ultimately, uh, we ran out of money and had a fire sale to Wind River in Alameda, California. Um, which we called Wind Driver. Uh, <laughs> they made VX Works um, and some other crap. Uh, but they were only interested in acquiring the FreeBSD engineering assets. Uh, so I was brought in and told what was happening and handed a severance check, and that was it. That was the end of my time with uh, Slackware. Uh, it wasn't really a shock. We kind of knew it was coming. We just didn't know when. Uh, about uh, two months prior, SUSE laid off all of their North American employees. Um, every company started laying people off. Uh, it was just kind of, you know, the wallets were empty at this point. Um, Wind River's idea was that they could be unique and go with FreeBSD uh, in the embedded market. But what's funny now is they focus on Linux, but whatever. Things that seem forgotten. So Slackware had live CDs before they were popular. Um, and I think that most people forget that because at that point in time, uh, CD-ROM drives were still fairly uncommon. And even if you had one, most people didn't have burners because they were very expensive, which is why the live CD was not posted as an ISO to download. Uh, you had to buy the CD set. That was kind of a value add as we give you a live CD. And this was, I mean, for a long time, Slackware had this. And uh, it just sort of, no, no one remembers that, I guess, or no one, um, it wasn't, it wasn't a big enough impact because at the time it was available, it just wasn't as useful as it is today. Uh, does anyone remember Zip Slack and Big Slack? Yeah, okay. That was, oh yeah, yeah. That was, uh, that was kind of a cool hack that Pat came up with um, doing, uh, using the UMS DOS file system, but then keeping it, uh, he kept Zip Slack around 100 megabytes and uh, Big Slack was the size of a jazz drive, uh, the one gigabyte thing. Uh, I, I thought they were really cool. It was, you know, this was again the time period before USB flash media. So, you know, you had, yeah, exactly. Yes, yeah. Uh, that was kind of the target media. Um, and 
it, it, they were very common. I mean, it, everyone had a zip drive at that point in time. Um, I still have one. Uh, installation to UMS DOS. This was um, something that Slackware did that I thought was really unique uh, to allow people to install Slackware and not uh, have to repartition or reformat, which at that point in time was quite difficult to do safely and not lose data. So you could just clear a bunch of files off of your PC, make space on your fat volume, and then just install Slackware into a directory on that. And it worked. It wasn't going to be fast, um, but it was, it was enough to get you um, some experience with it before diving into the uh, repartitioning and resizing. The tools for that at that point in time were, were very, very limited and uh, <laughs> scary. Old software sucked um, a lot. Current software sucks too. Um, my list of things that I dislike in the world of Linux keeps growing every day that I continue using Linux. And I think part of that is because I've been using it too long. Uh, you know, we make fun of old Unix people for hating things like GNU Bash and stuff like that. And they're like, ah, it's not like Born Shell. It's what I started on and stuff. Well, you know, we get that way in the Linux community too. I hate GNOME 3. I hate SystemD. I hate C groups. I hate current KDE. I don't use any of this crap at all. Um, and yeah, you know, I mean, I just, but I know, I know its purpose. Uh, I know the user it's trying to target, but it's not me. So with that, we do have a lot of things that just work out of the box now. And for that, I'm very thankful. The Linux kernel has come a long way, and hardware has come a long way. We don't have to deal with finicky hardware anymore. Um, and I also think the popularity of Linux in general for getting major hardware companies to commit full-time people to maintaining kernel support. Without that, we wouldn't have things like wireless networking or sound that works without spending a week futzing around with the kernel. Uh, we used to kill so many hours working on that kind of stuff. And if I was doing this presentation back then, I would probably pick one thing to talk about and tell you how to write a config file or tell you how to recompile your, your kernel to get one thing working. That's what we did back then. So what am I talking about? You wanted a GUI? All right, that meant you're using X386. Not so bad, right? Well, you got to write your XF86 config file. OK, well, that doesn't seem so hard. I defined some font paths. Oh, well, you know, I can probably go with the template. Ah, but then you get to mode lines. <laughs> Who remembers mode lines? How many people fried a monitor with all that stuff? Yeah, all right, there we go. That was sort of the rite of passage. You destroy some hardware just to get a GUI. All right, and then, of course, you know, it's going to run in 16 color until you figure out what line you had to change in the screen section. Uh, in the virtual virtual, because we all had 640 by 480, or if we were lucky, 8 by 6. And X wanted to run as if it were on a screen this size, and so you had that virtual thing. It's like, who, who thought that was useful, right? And you had to go and set that to 0, 0 to make it usable. OK, you've got your mode lines written. You have X386 up and running. Now you need a window manager. Well, we don't have desktop environments. We, we have to pick a window manager. Which one do I use? I don't know anything about window managers. Which one are you using? FVWM? OK, I'll go with that. That sounds good. Can I have your config file? Thanks. All right, now I'm just going to adapt that and hope it works. Now all I have is Xterm. I spent all that time to get a graphical user interface only to get a command prompt and a window. Yes, it was fun. Well, let's browse the web. Oh, no, wait, hold on. We've got to configure dial-up. <laughs> Anyone ever use dial-up on Linux? Yeah, it's fun, right? Yeah, spent a lot of time. OK, let's get online. If you have Ethernet and you're at a university, awesome. Just plug it in and use ifconfig and, or DHCP, whichever client you prefer at that point in time. But most of us had dial-up at home. We didn't have broadband. We didn't have any of that kind of stuff. And PPP was a bitch to configure. Um, yeah, and it's, you know, I, I feel sorry for anyone who still has to work with this. Writing chat scripts by hand. Um, but, but, to ease the pain, Slackware did come with PPP setup which was extremely useful. It was just a dialogue-based shell script. And it worked on other distributions. I copied it to a lot of systems and used it to configure PPP. And it was enough to get up and running so that you could then browse the web. Oh, yeah, wind modems. Yeah. Oh, no. Oh, man. Well, at this point in time, you're just kind of screwed. Sorry. 
you know, you can go buy a USR, you know, yeah, so. Okay, now let's browse the web. Links, really, I gotta use that, that sucks. Yeah, I wanna, I wanna see what's on the web. Well, Netscape Navigator is your answer. So fire that up, oh wait, it doesn't come with Slackware because it's commercial software. So you gotta go to ftp.netscape.com, dive down 9,000 directories, find the tarball, run the setup script, which is effectively pointless, which is just copy stuff somewhere, and then find the binary, run it, and the fonts look like crap. Also, why is it so slow? Why is it so slow? It was a motif, it was statically linked. None of us had commercial motifs, so they had to link the library in, but I'm glad they did, otherwise we wouldn't have had a browser. Who cares, some commercial company released software for Linux, and that was the big thing. You know, I have Netscape running on my Linux host. That was pretty cool. No, oh, that was terrible. Let's watch a movie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not gonna happen. <laughs> Well, what did we use? We didn't have VLC, we didn't have mPlayer, and have Totem, the whole GStreamer stack, whatever the hell KDE has, we didn't have any of that. We used Xanim. Who used Xanim? Okay, compiled from source, after finding your object files that you needed. Okay, so this guy up in Massachusetts, he, he decided that he was gonna do this service for the open source community, this thankless job, and sign these NDAs with the companies holding the patents for the codex. Then he would compile all of the codex. He wrote his code so he can compile it all as individual object files, post the object files for you to download, and you pick the codex you want. And he had them built for different architectures. So you had Intel, uh, you had Spark, Alpha, all this stuff. He did this just on his own time. You would download these, you had to edit your uh, uh, I make file, <laughs> then run xmkmf-a, then edit your make file because it was going to generate a bad make file, and then build it, and hopefully you got an XANM binary that would play a QuickTime movie that you downloaded two weeks ago, but then you found out that it was using the Sorensen codec and that was not available. And all you wanted to do was watch a trailer for a movie. Well, maybe I can look at a PDF. That actually worked. Adobe has always released Acrobat Reader, and you could always get it from ftp.adobe.com. That's actually really cool. Adobe sucks in a lot of ways, but they always made sure that this was available and you didn't have to dive through their damn website to get it. You just had to go to the FTP site. And surprisingly, it was not completely terrible. It actually did work, and the fonts didn't look like crap. <sighs> How do I play music? Can I do that at least? I can't watch a movie, web browsing's slow. I can play music, right? Well, you gotta recompile your kernel. Okay, so let's, let's get ready for that, buckle in. Okay, you gotta pick the right OSS options, um, and then you gotta build a sound.o file for your system. These don't come with the distribution because you can only pick one sound card driver. It's gonna output one sound.o file. Hope you get it right. Now you use mod probe to load that module. You should be good to go at this point. You should have dev DSP, dev audio, dev mixer, all that'll be working. Oh. Your system locked up? Why didn't you tell me you had an ISA sound card? Now we have to initialize ISA PNP hardware. Does anybody remember doing this? All right, gotta run PNP dump. Now you're gonna get Etsy, Etsy ISA PNP.conf, delete all the crap in there, take only the settings for your device, edit rc.local, make sure you run ISA PNP to init the device before running mod probe. Now, doing that, you should have sound. This list goes on and on forever. Old stuff sucked. And we have a lot in the world of Linux to be thankful for. Our, uh, our problems now, yes, we have a lot of things that we argue about and bicker about and you know things don't work and stuff, but at least all this stuff is kind of behind us, right? Like I was able to plug this laptop into the projector and it worked. If I was doing that in 1998, <laughs> yeah, that's not gonna work. I mean, I, I could try. All right, now, I recently tried to install Slackware. I will confess that I have not used Slackware since I was fired. Um, and I did an install in a KVM vert guest, and I was surprised at some of the things I noticed. First off, why the hell is Lilo still in use? <laughs> okay, all right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Right, exactly. So Lilo is not going to work for UEFI systems. Yeah. So I was surprised to see it still in use. That was, that was very odd to me. I did notice the huge kernel lacks vert IO drivers, which you need for a KVM guest. It would be nice if that was included in the huge kernel, but that doesn't really matter. The website's largely unchanged, and I'm embarrassed by that. Would someone please change that? Because it's what I did back in the mid-90s. <laughs> Um, but probably most importantly, why does Slackware appeal to so many people in the southeastern United States? <laughs> I mean, Patrick's from North Dakota. So, this is kind of weird. And I, I say that... Oh, yeah. I, I don't know. I say that because as a former core team member, we were at the Georgia Institute of Technology in Atlanta. This is... It's still... It's still largely southeast. I find that really interesting. OK, things I wish we had done. Regrets. All right, public read-only version control. We never had anything available for that, and I really wish we had, which would have required us actually using version control. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I know. And I, I've had that discussion with Patrick a lot. And you know, I understand why he doesn't want to use it. It's just another, another level. but. Having that history, like I'm telling these stories right now, that's kind of why you want to use version control, is you preserve all that history, all those things you did and undid and stuff like that. Um, it would be nice. Uh, it's probably easier now. Um, doing this with CVS probably would have been annoying, but it would have been possible uh, back then. Um, added network install support sooner. We actually had um, support for that, but never really pulled the trigger on getting that merged in. Um, but I noticed I did a network install uh, when I installed recently, so I saw it was there. I wish we had had a wiki or whatever the hell was the current thing at that time. We did have the forum, which a lot of people relied on for sharing information. But I today see the Arch Linux wiki as being a really good resource, even for non-Arch users. And if Slackware had something like that, yeah, I, I mean, it could even start something today. Um, I think that there's a lot of a lot of that knowledge that could get written down and just you know maintained by everyone. Uh, I wish we had had that. And there's probably something else that I'm forgetting. So that's all I could come up with when I made this. So let's have the questions. Nope, none. What is that? Oh. Oh yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, I do remember these. There's a phone number on here. Let's call it. <laughs> Let's see who answers. All right, it is 2014. Um, let's see. 510 <laughs> My former employer. <laughs> yes. Any other questions? They did, yes. They did. They, um, FreeBSD underwent a lot of changes at that point in time. Uh, Jordan Hubbard left, uh, and he went to Apple. And it was when Mac OS X was uh, still very new. And he, was, he took on the role of basically building up the Darwin project inside of Apple. And that, over the course of, I think, six to 12 months, uh, he started bringing in a lot of the former FreeBSD guys. And he went, he went to Wind River first, because, you know, they, yeah. So yeah, they ended up with nothing. Um, uh, I did hear that that uh, that they spun off that stuff again as like freebsdmall.com. Yeah, so uh, same group of people, I guess. But so, do you have any involvement with them with Slackware today? No. Okay.
Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it was God off you can never compile. You can never compile. Oh, I know. You can only compile on the previous name of some ancient version. Yeah. And they never even don't know what they were doing in the Bible. They probably don't know. Yeah, they don't. The one guy who didn't know what he was doing was Chinese and spoke very little English. I You know, I find this really interesting because I thought that no one working on the book would have a worse time than we did, but it sounds like you did. <laughs> I I can hook you up with that LaTeX source. Yes, yeah, okay. So there were a lot of in jokes uh that we put in um the uh, book and one was hijaz which was i don't know how many times it appeared um so <laughs> there's the other one yeah okay so so hijaz i do remember we used it as a um, test case for the index generating code because we knew how many times it appeared so then we looked in the index and if it had counted them all we were like yeah that's probably good enough um <laughs> but uh hijaz was uh all right, so Chris was from, or is from Charlotte, North Carolina. And when he was in high school, they were at some event, um, I forget what it was, it doesn't matter, but it was a public event and there were a group of Shriners there um, and they were wearing those hats. And uh, the hats had you know, writing on them and I don't really know all the details of, of that organization, but I just know they have those hats. And uh, he said, one of the hats said Grand Master of Hijaz. And he just thought that was really weird. So his group at school started using the word Hijaz as just a generic filler. Now my first exposure to the word was at Georgia Tech when he came in, we were all working on a project, and he's like, what the hell is all this Hijaz about? And I was like, what the hell are you talking about? And it just sort of stuck. So we started using that word as just a generic filler for everything. And that's where it came from. Not as interesting as you were hoping for, probably. <laughs> 47, of course, uh, we tried to put that in there as many times as possible. Yeah, yeah. Um, we, um, I can't remember, we had a brief table, table of integrals uh, that we tried to put into the book, but I don't know if they removed that or not. Um, it's not there, okay, they removed it. We can bring that back. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it means nothing, basically. Just filler word. It's really, I mean, it's explaining an inside joke, it never really carries forward. You know, it's the timing and, and stuff. Right. Well, and everyone does, and we wanted something different than, than foo. So, yeah. We had our own filler word. Yes, yes, yeah. Questions, comments, anything else? No? I was surprised to hear that some Yes. Um, less so than most other companies. Um, Sun, Sun didn't really know how to advertise that fact, but their engineering staff really wanted to work well with Linux, um, uh, even on their own hardware. Uh, they still wanted to position Solaris as the primary OS for their Spark hardware, and it, you know, that's fine. But they never, you know, tried to stop any of these porting efforts, and which, which I thought was really unusual. Um, uh, but they, they saw it as something they needed to be part of, and they needed to be in front of it.
Yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's um, the, there are similarities. Uh, Sun did try to make their own distribution. Uh, it was based on SUSE, um, but they didn't really they didn't know how to execute that very well. They tried to use the sort of the Sun model of um, making it available, and that just doesn't. You had the Linux market over here, and you had the Sun market over here, and they were putting it in the middle, and no one no one ever really noticed it, um, which was interesting. Of course, they really tried to push Solaris on x86 hardware uh, towards the end, um, but it was too late at that point. Some of those final Linux World shows, um, one of their, basically half of their booth was devoted to demonstrating a program called LX Run, which was uh, that they had acquired. It was, it was a tool written by someone in Europe or some company in Europe, and it would allow you to run uh, Linux, uh, compile Linux code on Solaris x86 um, unmodified. And you're thinking, okay, well, you know, that's probably going to be a good stopgap. But they demoed it running uh, Quake 2, the Linux version of Quake 2, and that worked completely, and you, you could play it. Uh, and they, that, was, that was what they were trying to push, come to Solaris on x86, and you don't have to give up your Linux applications. Didn't work out. But. Any other questions, comments? I mean, I've, I've got a lot more stories. I know there was stuff in here. Do what now? You know, I thought he would be here this year, but I, I, I didn't talk to him before heading down here. But yeah, yeah. Um, when was that? OK. Yeah, I. Oh, ah, yeah, battle over compilers, packaging formats. I'm looking what I at what I was supposed to talk about. Um, <laughs> no one asked me about these things. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So file system standards. Uh, we still argue about that shit, and it's so. Irritating, you know. I don't care where stuff is. Just don't put it in dumb locations. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, well, here's what I predict with that: is we'll go back, we'll move everything back to user at some point. Um, but I, you know, whatever. I <laughs> uh, packaging formats that was a big argument for a long time, um, and the commercial vendors just didn't even bother. Uh, making RPMs or DEBs or um, TarGZ files because you know, it's just a waste of time. It's um, when you have every vendor making their own slightly different uh, delivery mechanism for software. Um, I actually wish that we, as a sort of community, Linux in general, could standardize on something like that and just leave it as is. Um, all the systems are roughly comparable um, and where they have gaps, there are add-on tools. So it, it's, I think it would help a lot of people like distributing software, making software available. Um, but you know, whatever. <laughs> we may get there at some point. Uh, we had a lot of compiler issues early on, uh, back when we had uh, EGCS. Does anyone remember that? Um, so we had EGCS, and we had um, uh, KGCC for a while um, on some platforms and uh, GCC 2.7.2.3 in which we uh, stuck with for a long time that was kind of the the main compiler um, EGCS eventually merged into GCC of course um, but not before Red Hat released a CVS snapshot causing SO name problems for everyone on the planet um, hooray <laughs> uh, I've gotten the story of that internally sort of partially at Red Hat, and it was not, uh, despite what we talked about at Slack, where it was not a move uh, that was meant to hurt anyone, it was a bad engineering decision that was not communicated with marketing. Um, they came in and said, we have to release right now. It's like, whoa, hold on, no, we're not ready. Uh, we need to wait. And they said, nope, too late, it's already gone to publishing. So uh, 
eh, Red Hat was small at that point. So, yes, yes, exactly. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I've got plenty of other stories and uh, painful things, lots of, uh, uh, <laughs> SUSE is a, is a fun company to make fun of. Uh, they've, they've had a lot of interesting uh, moves over the years. Uh, one of my favorite stories is uh, uh, SUSE, well, I don't know if, if you guys know, but SUSE was originally a German translation of Slackware um, with the agreement that they would never market it in the US. So of course they didn't do that. Um, they merged, uh, whatever the company was, merged with something else and they took uh, the German uh, Jurix, J-U-R-I-X, um, I think that's what it was called, and uh, that became the next SUSE. So what they actually marketed in the US wasn't Slackware anymore, it was a totally new thing, but you know, the animosity is still there. Um, but yeah, they, they had some, uh, some brilliant uh, engineers uh, when they, they released a security update one time that included a developer's mail spool file in the RPM, um, which, was, which was pretty cool. Um, <laughs> And this was back before you know build systems existed and you had checks in place and stuff like that. Um, they also uh, they kind of had Gen 2 syndrome for a while where they uh, started experimenting with every possible GCC option thinking that the one line description that it gave you in the man page sounded pretty cool so let's try that. Uh, so they built, um, I forget what the option was, but they built with a symbol mangling option for C++ um, and did an entire release that way that ended up breaking um, every existing binary and then every everything that was commercially built could not run uh, so they had to go and fix that but they were already stuck with it because they had released it so they had to carry compatibility uh, libraries and symbols for that so don't just randomly choose C flags was their lesson learned uh, hopefully retained but they continue to surprise me with their ability to stay around and Stay green. <laughs> um, well, uh, I think the timing uh, for Slackware making that move was probably a bit too late, honestly. Um, but not, you know, not like super late. Um, people were asking for it, uh, and the the big the big interest there was maintaining compatibility with. Uh, things like Netscape and other commercial software, because they're going to start building for glibc-based distributions, and you need to have compatibility with that. Um, I, I think that the way Slackware did that uh, was pretty straightforward and done well. Um, I know there was a lot of pushback because glibc was this huge project compared to libc5, but it really, I think it was good in the long run if you still had multiple C libraries out there uh, today uh, for major distributions it would just be way too painful. Yes, yeah. There were, and, and libc5 development had stopped um, uh, you know well before the move in 7.0. Uh, yeah, it, I mean, it was controversial. Um, I'm glad that Slackware made that move. Um, I, there was really no reason to hang on to libc5 other than it would avoid having to rebuild everything, um, which is just a lot of work. But it, it made things easier in the long run. Um, all right, on the <laughs> surprises uh, or the observations I noted, I forgot to mention that uh, uh, I was surprised that Pam is not there still. Uh, Pam support for authentication, um, which is uh, to me quite surprising. But Patrick was uh, not not a big fan of Pam uh, stuff. But Yes. Exactly. Well, it's similar to the glibc transit. It's like when do you 
make that decision. And you know, yeah, it's uh, if he's ready to to do that, you know, um, uh, 1999, we'll welcome him, um, and we can get Pam in Slackware, which is uh, useful. Um, yeah. Like I said, I have lots of other stories. I just need catalyst to get going. It's hard to come up with this on my own. Um, and, you know, beer is also welcome. Um, so, you know, you guys want to chat over, over some drinks, uh, you know, that, that's fine. Um, it was a fun time uh, working on Slackware, and uh, I, uh, I'm glad I was part of uh, that ride when, uh, when Linux was gigantic and we had a lot of companies in there. Um, and it, it's kind of an experience that you can't ever replicate, but uh, it's interesting to see it continuing, though, in a different way now. Uh, I mean, Linux is still huge, but it's all new names and all new signs. And hopefully Slackware can continue to remain around. I look to Slackware as a voice of reason and conservatism when it comes to engineering decisions. Uh, they usually offer a uh, safe option if you're looking for how to do something. Um, and I think that is a huge quality uh, for Slackware to carry. Um, and it's also a really good uh, distribution for people to understand how a system is put together. Uh, it still serves that purpose very well, I think. Um, so yeah. I don't know if I'm out of time or not, but there you go. I was expecting more heckling. Customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up.